Um, this month we're going to, I don't even know where we are. We're in the middle of the month, isn't it? All right, so in the middle of the month. And so we are um, Restoration City Church. That's our mandate. And part of, could you just turn this down? It's just, it's just echoing a little bit. It's just restoring, going back to the place of restoration, bringing us back to the place, the original plan and purpose, what God has for us. And, and just bringing, sometimes we have to just come back to where God has called us to make sure that we're on the right path, the right road. And that what God has planned for us, that we are seeing it being fulfilled in our lives. And so I want to start a, a journey with us. And we're going to be dealing with restoration in terms of our home and our family. Um, I was saying on uh, February the 14th, for, for, for me, 30 years um, in proposing to my beautiful wife. 30 years ago. 30 years ago. I said it then and I say it now, I, I know I was punching above my weight, but I was just like, you know what, if you don't ask, you don't get. If you don't ask, you don't get. So I, I took the, I'm not a person who normally gets nervous, but that day I was nervous. I'm serious. I went to the Queen's Hotel. I had my music. I told them what music to play. I set everything out. Everything was cool. This is what you do. When I hear this particular track, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going down on my knees. And then this is what I'm going to do. But I had a contingency plan. Just in case you said no. Just move on quickly. Just bring the food. We move on quickly. We pay that bill and we're out of there quick. Um, so we had that contingency plan. But thank God uh, my wife, she said yes. Amen. So uh, for that 30 years, it's been a journey. We've learned things along the way. And... And I want to bring some of the things which I've learned along the way in, in my teaching. Um, I need it to be said, we are not perfect. We, we're learning. We've, we've, we've discovered some things. We've asked questions. We, we've gone through. You don't always learn from the perfections of your life. You learn from some of the mistakes that we make along the way. And we, so some of those things we want to be able to impart it. But more than anything, I really want you to celebrate your own family. I really want you to celebrate the things that you have achieved. Because sometimes, sometimes we get beaten up so hard because there's no script book for this. Um, and sometimes we, we don't value in our own family the sacrifice, the things, the good things which are going on in our family. Sometimes we look at other people's family and celebrate them, but we don't celebrate our own family, of ch the things which you have achieved in your own house. And the things you've achieved as mom, the things you've achieved as dad, the things that you've achieved as a, as a couple together. We, so I, I want to be able to bring that to the forefront as well and to celebrate that. So I just don't want us to feel that um, only my, my family's got it together. and No, because if, if my wife was to take the mic, she can, she'll humble things very quickly. She'll bring me to a very humble place. So we're learning together. But I like to allow the Word of God to to give the direction for us to, to help. Um, I say it's like, I, I put it this way, it's like if you're going to be taking a long journey, you, 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 you're planning, if you get in, into a car and you're planning a long journey, say you're going to drive to Scotland, you make all the provisions. You make sure that you, you bring a little bit of extra food, you bring some water, you bring some entertainment, you make sure you carry your car to make sure you, the tires are correct, you've got water. You, do, you, do you know what I mean? You do all the necessary things. I just you kind of I want you to imagine this. So you've got the car, and you've got the mum, dad, and you've got the kids at the back, and you're taking a long journey. What is important is that you need to have a destination where you're going. You can't jump in the car and you're just driving and you have no destination. And that is so important when you're looking, when you're dealing with family, you're dealing with relationship. You need to know what goal. You need to know where you are going. So where you see, like, for my wife and I, for where we are now, it wasn't we stumbled across this by accident. We talked about this 30 years ago. What we've seen is our discussions, which we talked about years ago. Because I'm not a person who's just going to be just going around the wilderness like a fool. Done that before, I ain't doing that again. So you, you have a destination where you need to go. What is, in, is important, because you're not know, like when you get onto the motorway and when you have young kids in the car, and especially when life we was going up to Blackpool, 
and you, you know, and you jump on the M25, you know, sometimes the M25 could be, it's still feeding back a little bit in the full bags. The M25 could feel like a long time. And you can kind of imagine the kids, you know, are we there yet? And you're like, we're just on the M25. We ain't even hit the M1 yet. You know, are we there yet? And you've got to understand sometimes when you're driving, you have your, the, the father may be driving the car, the wife is behind with the children. The children need some entertainment. But as you're driving, you need something or some system to navigate. And the best navigation system you have is the Holy Spirit. That's, that's your sat-nav. That's where you need to go. My wife and I, we went somewhere on Friday and was coming back. And um, the sat-nav was telling me, um, in the next um, 1,000 meters, turn left, head towards Bromley. And I'm like, I ain't going towards Bromley. That's some long route. I'm going this way. And I'm driving, I'm going this way. And I'm going down and I'm heading down Seven Oaks. Because I think that's the route I'm meant to be going, going down Seven Oaks. Turn off into Seven Oaks and the sat nav is telling me I should have turned left. It's like, no, I know what I'm doing. And I turned into Seven Oaks. Brothers and sisters, I don't know where I was going. We end up in some, some dark country lane. And, and you see, being a driver, I'm just like, man, this sat nav is, this sat -nav's got some issues. I said, you know what? I said to my wife, I got the wrong phone. You know, what I need to do, I, was, I used the wrong phone for the sat nav. And the sat nav, the phone gave me the wrong information. So what, what I need to do is I need to pull over and put the right phone to get the right information. You understand? Because it's not my fault. It's the phone. You know, it's giving me the wrong information. So I plug in a different phone, same information, but you know what? No, I mean, it got me to the, it got me home. It got me home. That's all you need to worry about. But sometimes what happens is the good thing about the Holy Spirit when we jump in our, in our, in, in our lives and we go in and sometimes the Holy Spirit's telling us, you know, you need to turn left at the next turning, turn left. Sometimes we ain't listening to the Holy Spirit because we know best. But the good thing about the Holy Spirit there's a time when it recalculates, recalibrates. And if you give it that moment where it can recalibrate, wherever you, you are, it will get you back onto the right road. Amen? And so sometimes we just need to have that patience. Just, and, and sometimes as men, we, you know, we're in the driving seat. But sometimes as men, we become tired. You just become tired. And you can't have the, the husband and wife trying to fight the same steering wheel together. You remember you told them that, um, Amanda? When two people trying to fight on the same steering wheel, you're going to crash the car. Someone, you know, you, you need one person to be able to steer. But sometimes illness comes. Sometimes circumstances come. Sometimes things which you didn't anticipate comes. And you've got to come out in the driving seat for a moment. And I've got to let my wife get in the, the, the steering wheel sometime. And she's got to and drive. As long as the sat nav's working, we're going to be all right. As long as, it's sat, as long as the Holy Spirit is giving us direction, sometimes I can't always have the steering. Sometimes it's tiring. Sometimes I need to rest. And so sometimes my wife has to take over, and she's going to have to drive. But she ain't driving all the way. Not all the way. And so we're just going to allow the Holy Spirit to give us the direction we need. And if we allow the Holy Spirit to give us the direction we need and trust that sometimes as, as we're going along in life, sometimes it don't feel right. Sometimes you take some B roads and some other roads, some back roads, and you're thinking, no, I want to stay on the motorway. It seems like it's the safest route. But sometimes that motorway is clogged up. And the Holy Spirit saying, you need to, you should have turned this way, turned this way. And if we can just, just allow the Holy Spirit to just give us the directions, I believe our family and our homes will be all right. Amen? And so I want to just do some teaching in regards to our family at home. And I, I decided I want to start from a different perspective. I want to start from the perspective of, of love. I wanted to start from love, because normally I always start from Genesis. I always start from there. But I thought, I thought about God, and I thought, it's, it's really hard to, to speak about God. And if you're going to do any study, if you're going to study anything about God, you, the best place to start is from a place of love. If you can start from love, everything makes sense. Because everything he does is out of love. And, and so I wanted to start from that perspective of love, and then we build from there. Amen? So if you will go with me into 1 Corinthians chapter 
13. First Corinthians 13. And we're going to read from verse number 4. First Corinthians 13 and, and verse number 4. And it reads thus. Um, I'm just re reading from the King James Version, New King James Version. It says, love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. It's not puffed up. Does not behave rudely. Does not seek its own. It's not provoked. Thinks no evil. Does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Bears all things, believes all things, hope, hopes all things. Verse number eight, love never fails. But whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether they are tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part will be put away. And just verse number 13, it says this, And now abides faith, hope, love, these three things. But the greatest of these is love. And verse number 14, and just the first two words that is there, it says, pursue love. Pursue love. Let's bow our heads. Father, we thank you for your word. We just pray that the entrance of your word will bring light and life and illumination and revelation. Help us to walk in the counsel of your words so that our lives, our homes, and our families will be changed because your word has touched our lives. We give you praise and thanks in Jesus' name, and we say amen. The Apostle Paul, he, he lists out 15 very powerful points as he deals with the subject of love. And as we begin to examine these points, it's, it brings a point of reference. It's a place where... We don't just read it, but you read it, but you reflect on it. Because sometimes, you know, these are the scriptures, if you go to any wedding, literally most weddings, this is a scripture which they use, they kind of brush over it. But really, that wasn't the purpose of it. The purpose really is for us to, to look at these words and to begin to reflect them into our lives and to see how the love of God can really change a person's life. That's really what it's about. When God's love really touches us, that we become, we can be changed. Some of the challenges we have, especially as men, is when we look and we're saying, when we're growing up and we're looking and we're saying, who do we use as a role model? When, when people are saying that, you know, you need to be a better man, you need to be, a, you, you know, a godly man, and you need to be the man of God. And sometimes when, this is great, great words, but when, if you're growing up and you're growing up like a, in, 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 a, in a single um, parent in the household when you just have a mother as, as, as the, the main person and you're looking for that male comparison and sometimes you don't find that mentor, you don't find that person you can aspire to. But there is no excuse because you can use Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the perfect role model that you can look at as an example, especially when it comes to the context of love. And as a, as a man, my desire is to become more like Jesus. The more I become like Jesus is the better the man I'm going to be. The better the husband I'm going to be, the better father I'm going to be, is when I begin to use and begin to look at the life of Christ as an, a reflection of myself. So when I'm looking at the life of Christ, I'm going to see the imperfections in my life. I'm going to see the, the, the places where I've come short on. And the idea is to look at the Word of God, reflect on the Word of God, examine my life in the context of the Word of God, and then begin to make, allow the Holy Spirit to help me to make those changes so I can become a better husband, a better, better 
better father. So many times we're using all these excuses. You know, I was brought up in a broken home. I was brought up from a single parent. That's no excuse. The word of God is there. You can read. And if you can't read, you can buy the tape where you can have it played to you. And you can listen to the word of God. There is no excuse why we cannot become the men of God. I know it's quiet. Ladies, you miss, a, you miss it big time. Missed it big time. There is no excuse why I cannot become a good father. There is no excuse why I cannot become a good husband. Absolutely no excuse. As long as I've got the word of God, and the word of God is there to, as a teaching, is, a, is there to help me, I can become a better person. Because we, we don't want to be in a place where our lives are just stuck. We ain't moving forward, we ain't moving backwards, we're just stuck. And some people, their lives are stuck. They get to a certain period in their life, and there ain't no, they're, just, they're stuck. But for those of us who are aspiring, I want to still be a better husband. I still want to be a better father. I want to be the, the very best that I can. Amen? So in this chapter, chapter 12, 13, and 14, really, when you look at those three chapters, 12, 13, and 14, it really should be read as a whole complete chapter. I know we have it divided, chapter 12, divided, chapter 13, chapter 14, but really it should be read within, within this context. It shouldn't really be divided. When you begin to look at chapter 12, <coughs> excuse me, it talks about the context of chapter 12 really talks about how the Holy Spirit begins to work in a believer's life. So when we receive the Spirit of God and we ask Jesus Christ to come into our lives, and he comes with the Holy Spirit in us. He comes to aid us. He comes to help us. He becomes our, as it were, our mentor. He becomes our teacher. And so chapter 13 begins to deal with some of the motivations of using the different gifts that the Holy Spirit puts inside of our lives. And, and chapter 14 deals with how we should properly operate in those gifts that God gives us. Because that's the kind of, kind of God we serve. The kind of father that we serve, when you receive his spirit into your life, he comes with gifts. Every person who is born again, every person who received Jesus Christ in their life, you don't come, you, you, you don't come empty-handed. God places gifts inside of you. That's there. And so now the, you just need to know how to operate in these gifts. And don't allow those gifts to become dormant in your life. They're there. But they need to be like with everything we have, you have to exercise it. You have to put it to use. But every one of us who are born again, who say that we are of Jesus Christ, we receive Jesus Christ in life, there is gifts. So Paul ends the chapter 12 by saying, I'm going to show you a more excellent way. So in other words, there's things which you already know, but I want to challenge your thinking. I want to challenge you to go beyond what you've already known, what you've already read, what you've already seen, what you've already learned. I want to tell you about a more excellent way, a higher level. Because for some people, when you talk about love, the only context that they know about love is what they see on TV. Or what they see on the internet. I, I'm serious. That's for some people, for, for you, I don't know, you, maybe your parents sat down and talked to you about sex. Maybe your parents sat down and talked to you, this is what you do, this is what you don't do, this is what the birds does, this is what the bees does. Maybe your parents done that. But for most people, most parents ain't going to do that because it's too embarrassing. <laughs> so where, where, where do some of the young people get to, to, to know about sex? Because the church ain't going to talk about it. The church ain't going to say it because we, we look at some of your faces already. Oh my God, what's he going? This is Sunday morning. So how are, this, how are some of you supposed to find out? They go on the internet. You Google it. Lord have mercy. Yeah, you're looking at me like I'm from... It's like... Because we, we train people how to do that. If you're trying to find some information, you go and Google it. You go on the internet and you search the information. Well, what do you think they're going to do when it comes to relationship? When it comes to sex? They're going to go on, on the internet for some people. So that's their context and that's their understanding is about this. So what Paul is saying is, I've got to bring you to a place of a more excellent way. What you have is standard. What you have is limited. But I've got to, I'm, I'm, I'm going to show you something that's higher than the level which you've already come to. So I'm going to show you a more excellent way. So he's just saying that the love of God in Romans chapter 5 says the love of God 
has already been shed, in, shed into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. So we have received the love of God. The love of God is now in us. This is what he's going to be talking about. It's about having the love of God within us. Um, 1 John chapter 4 and verse number 10 says this. In this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be a propitiation for our sins. So what Paul, what Paul is saying, I want to talk about the context of love. And I want to do it not just within the marriage, but within the home, within the family, the wider context. Because if you can get a strong family, you get a strong church. What we're trying to do is build a strong church without building a strong family. You're not going to have a strong community if you don't have a strong home. So it starts right where the rubber meets the road. Amen? So in the opening of this chapter, Paul is beginning to express the need for love and the value of love. Every single one of us were designed to be loved. Every single one of us, innate in us, is this desire to be loved. I want to be loved. What distorts that is when we've been abused. When we've been abused, our, our vision, our perspective of love becomes warped. But every single one of us should desire to be loved. And we have the capability and capacity to love others. Oh, Lord, help us. So the first place, of, the first place where I need to start from in everything is my relationship with the Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ. My relationship with my Heavenly Father. If you're going to go into any relationship with anybody and they do not have a relationship with the, live, with, with the Holy Father, you're going to have problems. If you call yourself a Christian and you're hooking up with someone who's a, not a Christian who don't believe in, in the Heavenly Father, you're going to have some challenges. I'm going to tell you from now. Because the first place of relationship is the person who gave me breath. The person who calls me to wake up in the morning, I've got to be thankful to him. Now, if I've got an issue with my Heavenly Father who gives me life, who gives me breath, who loves me, gave His Son to die for my sins, if I have an issue with Him and He's the life giver, I'm going to have problems with you. Because if I can't, can't appreciate the person who gives me life, if I can't appreciate the person who causes me to wake up every morning, if I can't appreciate Him, who's a life giver, how in heaven's name are you expecting a, a, a partner to, to, to put you above someone who, who gives life to you? So the first place you need to have is to have a relationship with the Heavenly Father. That's the first thing you need to have, is having a relationship with God. That's where it starts. If you're building a stronghold, building it, it starts with your relationship with God. How is your relationship with your father? Is he God or is he father? What, what kind of relationship do you have? Because if it's distorted, because I said all of us, in every one of us is this void. In every one of us came, we've, we've got this emptiness inside of us. It's always been there. There's always this empty void in all of our lives that can only be filled by God. Now, it doesn't say that you won't try using different substances to try to fill the void. You, you, you might even have different women or different men to try to fill the void, but when you finish, you still have a void. You can try all different types of substance when you, when, you know, get high as a kite, but when you finish, you're gonna, still going to come down, you're still going to have a void. There's always going to be a void in you until you meet the person called Christ Jesus. He fills every empty space. Every person has an emptiness in them. It's, it was, it's in you. There's an emptiness that can only be filled by Jesus Christ. Are you still here? And so when I have, when I get that vertical relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, it begins to fill that void. So I don't have to go from woman to woman to woman to woman and blaming a woman when the issue is me. Is because I've got this empty void. And that's why the pornography industry is so massive. Because there's a void. Say what you want. There's a void. And that void can only be filled by Christ. 
It can only be filled by Christ. So you can, you can put on any channel you want. You can try all the things you want. You will still be empty. You will still be empty until you come to Christ. Because the first place you have to establish is your relationship with your Father. If you get that right, that becomes a compass for everything else. But if you're trying to, to try to navigate a family, navigate a relationship, and you don't have a relationship with the Heavenly Father, it's like jumping into a car and driving and just kind of guessing where you're going. You never, even if you got there, you don't even know where, where you get, you don't even know where you're going, so you don't even know if you got there. It's, it's taking, it's, I'm going to use myself as, as an example. It's like saying, I want to be, I want, I'm the man. I'm the man. And so I'm going to lead my family. And my wife says, great, where are you going? Woman, don't ask me no question. <laughs> don't ask me no question. <laughs> That's our way out of it. Don't ask me no question. But wh where are you going? Because what my wife has to look at is, where is your compass? Where's your sat nav? Who's going to give you direction? If we're going to jump in the car and sit in this car with you, we need to have some idea. How long is this going to take? Where are you going? Because we need to make some plans as we go along the way, because that's what women are. I need to know how much dumpling I need to make. I need to make sure they're flask of tea. We don't think about that. Women do. They did the detail. I need to know where we're going. We need to know where to plan the toilet breaks. When to plan the rest breaks. We just jump in the car and be gone. Well, how much petrol you got in the car? Have you worked that out? So we need to first establish, if I'm going to be the, the head of the house and the father and the husband, I need to make sure that my relationship with the Heavenly Father is on point. My sat-nav needs to be working. My God-nav needs to be working. But if you have not connected to the satnav of your life, then don't ask the wife just to submit to you. Submit to what? Come on. How is a wife supposed to submit to you when you have no clue where you're going? But then you're quoting scripture, oh, wife must submit to the man. You know, read it in the Bible. Yeah, but wait, submit to where you're going. I need to bring, submit means bringing my mission under you. Where are you going? I'm not stupid. I can only submit to someone who has a mission. What's your mission? What's your purpose? Where are you going? Then I can begin to submit. But don't ask a wife to submit to you when you haven't got a clue where you're going. That's stupid. And our wives are not stupid. There you go, brother. Talk it strong. <laughs> so, 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 first we establish it's important as a man, it's important as a father, as a husband, that my relationship with God is sound. When I got that, then I need to also build up a relationship with myself. I never used to preach that, but the problem is, I can't love someone else if I can't even love myself. I have to invest in myself. I'm not talking about being arrogant and prepared. I mean loving myself. That I look at myself and I value myself. That there are some things I might need to change. The belly might have to go. Those things are, those things are workable. That means if I don't like what I see, I've got to go and fix it up. You all ain't hearing me. There's some things I can fix up. I can't change the fact that I'm six, two and a half and I'm handsome. I can't change that. I, I mean, that was fixed by cr the creator. I can't, I can't help that. I can't help. But there's some things I need to look at and say, what do I value about myself? You've got to have a relationship with yourself. You've got to be able to love yourself. You've got to be able to invest in yourself. You can't walk around with smelly armpits. Shirt don't change. Shirt don't iron. Look scruffy. If you, you can't even look at yourself in the mirror, but you want woman to look at you. Come on. Just because you've got a couple of lyrics, you, you think that's enough. 
fix up some deodorant. I was going to say some Avon, but we don't do Avon. <laughs> some little Gucci. Go and put some nice aftershave. Fix yourself up. Go to the barbers. Look good. Invest in yourself. And I'm not just talking physically. Invest in yourself psychologically. Mentally. In terms of how you think, in terms of how you are, so you're not some fragile person. Invest in yourself emotionally. Invest in yourself physically, spiritually. Invest in yourself. Invest in if your education, your job, whatever. Makes, put some effort into looking after yourself. Amen. When you've learned how to look after yourself, then you can start looking after others. Because it's going to start between you and God. Then I can start looking at how I love my family, how I love my wife. But some of the problems we have is that we have an issue with ourselves. But we project it onto our partners. Like they're the ones who's mad. And we, then we project it onto the children. You see what kind of demon children... Ain't nothing wrong with the children. Is you the one with the issues? You haven't taken care of your business. You haven't looked at yourself in the light of God's words. Because if you ain't, if you don't know the word of God, you can, I might be comparing myself to austere. I feel well. I'm a good man. Yeah, but that's to austere. Now go and look in the word. Because we might compare ourselves to some kind of. Gangster out there and say, well, we're not going around and we don't do this, we don't do this. That's, that's for those in the world. Raise your, the bar look a bit higher. Because yes, you might be better than some of the men in the world, but you're not in the world. You're in Christ. Amen. So what I've got to do, I've got to look, I'm not trying to compare myself with anyone else. I've got to look at the word of God and l allow the word of God to, to, to stop. I need to measure my life up with the word of God and see where I come short according to the word. Because if you're trying to ma compare yourself to me, you don't know what goes on behind closed doors. Because back in the day, a lot of the pastors and bishops who stand on pulpit, when they get home, they were giving their wives some of that. It was about 60%. It was high. A lot of black men were beating their wives and they were called Christians. So just because what you see in front of you, that ain't the full picture. Don't compare yourself with the full picture. You need to compare yourself with the word of God and let the word of God really begin to get into your heart and change you. Amen? Amen. Then I can start to love those around me. Is this making sense? Because sometimes what happens is we're bringing a whole load of junk. We're bringing a whole load of rubbish into our relationship and dragging the rubbish into the relationship. And what we should have done is got rid of the rubbish long time ago so that I could enjoy the company. My wife and I, we can enjoy, we can move, but we're dragging some stuff. We should have, if we invested in ourselves properly, we should have dropped those stuff off years ago. And so what happens is we get married with junk. And we bring junk into the marriage. We bring rubbish into the marriage. We bring unresolved issues into the marriage and blaming the marriage. Strip it down, strip it down. Blaming the marriage. It ain't a marriage. It's you. You're the issue. And what happens is you've got to address those things because when you can address it properly, when you can get that relationship between yourself and Christ and you can invest in yourself, then you can start to know how we can love one another. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay, so the Apostle Paul was just saying, look, I'm just bringing context. It doesn't matter how, how much you say, yeah, but pastor, I hear all that. But you've got to understand, God gave me this gift of healing. And I know, I, I know there's rubbish, I know there's garbage, but you know what? Every time I lay hands on people, they still get healed. Pastor, pastor, you don't understand. I've got this gift of prophecy. 
that I can prophesy. At the drop of a hat, I can see anybody that can just, you know, the word of the Lord is. Paul is saying, I don't care whether you can do healings. I don't care whether you can do miracles. I don't care whether you can preach. I don't care if you can speak ten languages. If you don't have love. I don't care what you say you can do. You can do all the kind of stuff. You can go through scriptures, you know, just doing gymnastics through the scriptures. I don't care. Paul says you need, you're just like a sound and brass and a tinkling cymbal. I don't want to hear none of that. I want to just, I simply just want to know, this is one thing, do you have love? Yeah, but brother, you don't understand. I can go into deep revelations. I can go into mysteries of the scriptures. Let's go into the book of creation, of Genesis. I can pull out creation theology on you. Yeah, but the question is, bro, do you have love? I know you think, yeah, but you don't understand. But last night, I was walking with angels, you know. Oh, no, seriously, I was walking with angels. Me and Angel, even Gabriel, we was, we was chatting, we was chatting. Me, me and him, just, we, we're buddies, mate. He calls me D. He doesn't even call me by my full name. He calls me D. Yeah, but that's great. That's, that's great. But do you have love? I, I just simply want to know. I, I know you're deep. I know you're deep. I know you get revelations straight off, straight from heaven. But my question to you simply is this. Do you have love? I don't care about your revelation. Great. Well, I, I know you've got the gift to heal. I know you've got the gift to prophesy. You can preach up a storm. Great. My question is, after you finish preaching, do you love your wife? When you finish healing everybody, can you, do you still love your children? That's, that's what it comes down. I just want to know. That's all Paul was saying. I know you're deep. I, Paul, Paul was getting revelation. He says from, I don't know if it was from, from this heaven or the other heavens. I don't know. I was getting some stuff. Paul was, Paul was deep. Paul was deep. But Paul is still saying, I don't care how deep it is. My question to you as born again believers is my question is, where is the love? I think we'll down and sing that. I don't know. But where is the love? So I, know so, I know someone sang that song. Uh, everybody said, go and pretend like they don't know, you know. Anyway, on the spiritual. <laughs> so he's just saying, this kind of love is not just what you talk about. This kind of love has to be what is demonstrated. Uh, this kind of love, there's love what you can talk about. There's love you can talk about. But I want to see this kind of love has to be demonstrated. Because if you look at the love of Jesus, he didn't just talk about his love. The Bible says, for God so loved the world, here's a demonstration, that he gave. It's demonstrated. He didn't just talk about love, he gave. Here is the love that not that we loved him, but that he loved us. So his kind of love was, I'm not waiting for you to love me. You, you see, in the early, you know, I, I need him to come out and chase after me. I'm not chasing after no man. I ain't chasing after no man. You, be, you must come chase after me, though. <laughs> you understand? But J Jesus was like, he ain't waiting for you to come chasing after him. He comes chasing after you. That's why we sang the song, your love keeps running running. So even though I'm trying to go in the opposite direction, because I want to live my life, I, I, you know, I don't want this church thing, I want to live my life, I want to max it out. His love still keeps running, it running, running after me. It keeps running. His love for us is relentless. Do you understand? His love for us is relentless. Even when we were yet sinners, he died. He didn't wait for you to love him first. Then he's going to die for you. Even when you, we were yet sinners, when I didn't want to know about him, kiss my teeth when it came to the church, his love still keeps coming after me. I should have been six foot under, but his love still chased after me. I said, you know what, even in a dream, some of the things which, you know, you, sh you shouldn't have gone, but you kissed your teeth and doing it anyway. Gone, gone to club. I remember, I remember one time, kids my teeth ain't going to no prayer meeting. Gone to club, and they, and the spirit of the Lord just began to whisper in my ears, "Get out of here, get out." I start making my way. Two twos behind me, man, pull out machete. 
man pull out machete, wheeling machete, and there's only one exit out. But the Lord kept pursuing me. When I didn't deserve it, his love, just, and here, he had enough love to still save my life. He had enough love to still whisper into this earzard. Earzard, brother. God's love still keeps. I, I know you don't want to go to, I know you don't want to go pray meeting. You should be at prayer meeting, but you don't want to go. But his love lifted me. Are you still here? It's his love. So in the Greek language, it has several different words to describe love. Come and shut them out. You must know them. Come on, what's the, come on, man. Yeah, all right, tell me what them is. Come on, you guys must come to, you go to enough weddings, man. Oh, yeah, Rose, yeah, we know that one. That one is a good one. That one is a good one. All right, filio or phileo is the idea of a brotherly love, and that's the kind of love and friendship. So in the Greek, they didn't know how to use the one word to cover everything. Or the one word had different meanings within that one word. And so the, 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 the use the word phileo, which means the brotherly love or the friendship that you have with each other. I'm going to do a teaching on friendship because how important it is for us to have friends. I was saying to, to Shara and mum that when I was studying this, I come across shame for myself. You know, I'm studying and I feel shame. And I said, I still got to preach it anyway, but I feel shame. Because what I discovered with the Pentecostal and Apostolic churches, we know how to entertain, because that's how I was raised. My mum cooked, on Saturday night, we cooked big pot of food, holy for food. And it was, the idea was when services finish, some people had too far to go home. And because we live around the corner, they come to our house and we entertain, we cook food, and, and we entertain people. We're really good at that. We're really good. You know, you have, in the summertime, you have a barbecue, you bun your barbecue, put your little burn up chicken on there and all that kind of thing. You know, you, you, you do your, your barbecue. And we're good at that. Pentecostal, apostolic people, we're very good at that. But what we're not very good at, my brother, is friends. We can entertain. But when I started to look and I was saying, okay, yeah, yeah, but we, we, we're friendly people. We, we're nice people. You know, people come around, if they want a cup of tea, I'll make them a cup of tea. If they want some I'll make them toast. It's not a problem. But when I started to look at myself, and then the question was, they were, how many friends have you really got? I see him. I see him. Because I know so much people. I know so much people. I'm not telling you no lie. I know so much people. But boil it down and say, right, forget about knowing how much people, how many of those people you know is your friend? Your friend. A shame. I, I don't know how I'm going to preach this text here. I, I, don't, I don't know how to, because I shame. Because one and two and three, really, in regards to friends, that can't be biblical. That can't be right. I'm looking and saying, Lord, I have, to, I have to repent myself. So give me a little time to work through my things. So when I come, I can preach a little bit more decent. But Christians, we, we're good at this Christian thing, but we're not good at friendship. Just tell you it as it is. So Philo is about this brotherly love. Where's the brothers in my life? Where's the brothers in my life? Because outside of church, we're cool. Because some of us, before we came to church, we had brothers. But I come into the church environment and no brothers. Shame. I'm telling you it's shame because it's wrong. I'm exposing this. It's wrong. Brothers are supposed to be tight, brotherly love. Friendship, love. Then you have eros, is the idea of sexual love, is where we get the word erotic from. So it's not wrong, it's just within the context of relationship. Because if me and my wife is going to get happy, I ain't singing, no, yeah, but I'm not going to be singing just like, as I am without a plea. <laughs> but thy blood was shed for me, and dust of bids me come to thee. <laughs> oh, Lamb of God, I come. 
That ain't gonna, that ain't gonna work for me. You better dim them lights down, baby. What's going on? Put on some proper music and we go. Hey, hallelujah. Um, <laughs> then you have the other word is stargate, which is the idea of love within the context of a family. That there should be love. There's a love that's in the context of a family. And then there was one that Paul began to speak about, which really didn't really appear until we got into the New Testament. And, and, and as we, we get into this New Testament, Paul is speaking about this different kind of love, this higher dimension of love that needs to be expressed as us as believers. And he speaks about this and he calls this what everybody knows as the agape love. And he was saying that, look, this, this kind of love is an action, is an action love. Because this love is a divine love. And this kind of love gives. And it gives. And it gives. And it gives. It's, 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 even when there is not a response, this love keeps giving. Even when sometimes there is no Valentine card, you forget the Valentine card. <laughs> or you forget to say thank you. This love is on a higher dimension because this love just keeps giving. Even when there's the response that you normally would want in a relationship, if I don't get that response, this love still keeps giving. Now, this love don't make no sense to those who are not believers. It make no sense because I ain't loving no one if you ain't loving me. You ain't, if you ain't giving something to me, I ain't giving nothing back to you. Done deal. I get it. But Paul was saying, there's a love that, that we are we receiving a revelation from God. There's this love that he's talking about, which is a more excellent way. And this excellent way helps you how to love your family, loves you how to love your husband, love your wife, in a way that you've never done before. In a way that you don't need to go to divorce court. Because there's a higher level. It's a much deeper revelation. It just keeps giving. It's giving. It's an unconditional love. <coughs> and this love is the highest and the purest form of love that exists. And John says this, this way, this love only comes from God because this love, listen to this, this love is the character of God. I said it again, this kind of love is not what you turn on your TV and see. This love is the character, is the nature of God himself. That's what this, this love is. So John 1, 4 verse 8 says, Whoever does not love, you don't know God. If you don't love, if you make a be right, I ain't loving nobody. I'm not loving nobody. It means your mind has been warped. I'm not loving nobody. It means, listen to me, don't even try praying. Because if you can't, if I can't love my wife and treat her properly, I don't know God. Hear the scripture. If I don't love my wife and look after my wife, I don't know God. And God says this, I'm not even going to listen to your prayers. You can't treat your wife properly. You can't treat your partner properly. God says, I don't even want to hear your prayers because you don't know me. The only way you know me is by how you demonstrate your love. Not what you say. I'm watching to see how you treat your wife. Come on, preachers. I just want to know when you finish preaching, how do you love your wife? 
That's why not many people want to preach this. We can preach it from the context of church, but now, preacher man, preach it from your home. Preach it from your family. Because if you don't treat your partner properly, and you don't love, the Bible says you don't know God. That's deep, brother. Because God is love. And it's only by the Holy Spirit can we get the power to demonstrate this kind of love. So when a person don't, if a person don't have a relationship with God, how are you going to love me? Come on. Come on. If you don't have a relationship with God, because God is love. Yes. Help the Holy Ghost. The more of him I have is the easier it is to love. But if I'm not drawing from the source of love, if it's not, where is, where is your love coming from? If your love is coming from the TV set, and that's the context of your love from the TV set, that's all you've got to give. TV love. <laughs> TV love. But when a person is drawing from the Spirit of God, from the heart of God, when a person who knows God and knows the heart of God, when he's drawing, when we like what we're doing today, when we're worshiping, you know, that's why some, some men, you see, when, when you see, I watch some of the men when you worship. Because you don't know, you don't know intimacy. Worship, you know, that's woman business. It's warfare. We do warfare. So what happens is, as men, you, you don't know how to get into the intimacy of worship. You know, so I, I, this one, you know, these, some of these songs are too women-y. You know, they're too lovey-lovey. I'm not that way inclined, you know what I mean? <laughs> but when a person knows the heart of God, knows how to tap into the heart of God, sing their song to God, Touch God's heart with the melodies of their worship. What happens is the father has to respond. And he pours his love into my heart. He pours his love into my heart. I receive his love. I'm not saying I understand his love. Because why would he love me? I have no idea. But I receive his love. And the more of his love I have in my heart is the easier it is now for me to give this love. To my, to my fellow being, to my wife, to my children, to those around me. But if I ain't pulling from the source, who is love, the character of God, where are you getting your love from? That's when the bedroom becomes interesting. Help us, Holy Ghost. I think I better stop here. I, t I think I think it's um I look a I look a sailor. It's look a sailor. The love of God is the more excellent way. The love of God we're gonna go through and you're gonna see the different characteristics that really makes up this love. Because I really believe as we begin to take this and examine this. And that's why the world don't understand us. The world can't understand us. Because this is of God. Marriages are of God. It was ordained by God. You can't ask the world to interpret something that's been ordained by God. You're going to have a dysfunctional side of it. Because as the scripture said, we only know in part. I wonder what kind of part you know. So... What, what I'm saying is a lot of our homes have become dysfunctional. A lot of our homes are breaking down. A lot of our homes are struggling. Relationships are struggling. We come to church and we struggle with one another because the word of God is not in us. 
we, 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 we're allowing other things to define our thinking and modify our thinking. And what we just need to do, what I'm doing as part of Restoration City Church, is just saying, let's restore. Let's just draw breaks a second. Let's, let's go back. Uh, as I said, please don't, please don't hear it in a, in a perspective I'm trying to criticize. I don't want to criticize. As I said, there's some great things that you're doing in your, in your relationship. In you need to celebrate what you're doing good. Wives, for those of you whose husbands are in the church, sell them, cook them a good food when you go home. The fact that they're in the house of God, celebrate that. You know how many, how many wives would just say, I wish my husband would, would step foot through the church just to turn up. You've got your husbands in the church participating in the church. Celebrate it. Celebrate your home. Celebrate your family. Celebrate what you've got. Don't look at, because sometimes we just look at, oh man, it's all jacked up, it's all messed up. But it can be fixed. It can be restored. Everything can be restored. Let's bow our heads. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your word. We pray that your word will bring light and understanding. Most of all, Father, as we just stand here, we just pray that there will be a revelation. There will be a revelation that, that comes to us about your love. And Father, if we are in, anyone in this room is in a place where they feel that their love has been depleted, <coughs> where they feel that their love has been exhausted, has just been given and they, their tank is empty, we pray, Father, that you will fill us up with who you are. Release your love deep inside of our hearts. Father, for those who struggle in terms of relationships, struggle with this word love, it seems so foreign. Word seems to be abused. And so, Father, as you bring clarity to our lives and you bring direction to our lives, I just want to lift up the families and homes that's represented here. Your word declares that all the families of the earth should be blessed. And so, Father, we just want to speak your blessing over our homes and our family, that you will hold us together. You will keep us together. And we pray, Father, that you will do exceedingly abundantly above all we ask or think. Do a work in our homes, in our families, in our relationships, amongst the sisters and brothers and siblings, husbands and fathers and children. May hearts be turned again, Father. May brokenness be healed. And we just speak into our families and speak into our marriages, speak into our home that there'll be a oneness. There will be a unity. We've come against a spirit of division that seeks to divide our homes. 